Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market and Deli. This morning's special guest that we have with us to go along with our garden series, uh, we have Laura Matter, Garden Hotline Educator. And it's always a pleasure to have her with us. And this morning, she's speaking on the topic of warm season edible gardens. Thank you so much, Laura, for joining us. Hey, happy to be here again. Um, always fun. <clears throat> the, um, the topic is going to be going through, you know, s s the things that we're growing in the garden during the warm season, things we can set out once the soil warms up. There is a little bit of info about seed starting, and I know <clears throat> if you joined us for the last one, I went through some of that then too, but I want to reiterate because it's still pertinent, there are still things you can start. Um, <clears throat> but we'll look at the difference between things that sit in the garden all summer long that should be going out now, if they're not already out, and the things that you can succession sow, which is different. Um, so let's take a look. Okay, let's see what's going to advance this thing. There we go. So first of all, just going back to sort of looking at what is a cool season crop these are things that usually are already in the garden they can handle cooler nights they germinate in cooler soil temperatures so a lot of times you can plant them directly in the garden from seed even in march or april uh, and but around now um, things like that typically are short season so they could be like a radish or lettuce that only takes a month or a month and a half and they are harvesting now um, they can bolt when it gets too warm. And also with that warm um, kind of jump in temperature we were talking about a minute ago, when, when you go from cool to hot, sometimes that triggers flowering in a plant and that we call that bolting because it's trying to set seed. And for things like lettuce, that makes them um, more bitter as they're growing. So you wanna make sure and get them as soon as you start to see that happen. Uh, with lettuce, typically you can see the the heads start to get kind of conical. There's a little bit of a tip that starts to develop on them and that's where the flower stalk's gonna come out. Um, so you wanna pick them before that happens. Things like chard, um, beets, um, those things can keep growing for a while. Uh, they typically don't bolt, they're biennial and they that's the good news is that they kind of hang in there even when the weather changes and um, just you can continue to harvest. So here's an example of some of the cool crops that you might already have in the garden. Carrots are one of those things that kind of tran transcend cool and warm. Um, <clears throat> it is one of the things you can succession sow pretty successfully because they can handle warmer temperatures. And then things like cabbage and kale are also things that you put in when it's cool, but they may be in the garden for months and may actually winter over depending on the type of plant you grew. right now. I'm not in controls. There we go. Okay, so what is a hot crop? Let me go back for a minute, make sure I got the right page. Okay, my controls are being a little finicky. Um, so hot crops, we, we talk about these in terms of what their needs are. So they're not something you can put in in March. Um, if you were to try to plant a tomato seed in soil in March, the soil is way too cold. They need at least 60 degrees temperature to germinate and warmer soil is better. And often you'll see, we'll talk about this in a second. You, you use heating mats to get them to germinate. Um, they, um, they need to have warm soil temperatures even when you set the plant out. And so this is a list of those kinds of plants that typically you're gonna see in um, warmer weather. You don't even see them start to be sold um, usually until later in the spring. A lot of times though, to be you know cautious, um, some places will get these out earlier than they should be set out. So even if you're buying them in April, um, it's often too cold. We can talk a little bit about ways to sort of um, push the, the seasons with doing um, cloches. We'll talk about that in a minute. But for instance, um, this is showing the different families of plants. 
the nightshade family, the Solanaceae is the tomato family. Those are really typically warm weather plants. There's one exception to that, that's potato, which can go out usually in March. Um, the cucurbit family, the cucumbers, summer squash, winter squash, melons, all those guys really want warmer soil temperatures. They can be started indoors as, as starts, but they often do um, just break from seed directly in soil once it's warm enough. Um, corn, so that's part of the grass family, really needs warm weather um, to produce. And the trick here is getting it out soon enough so that you can get it tall enough to actually produce in the Northwest. Um, they, you know, we shoot for um, having corn be knee high by the 4th of July, that's the saying. And so uh, if you can get it out in um, early June, late May, even with protection, you can make that happen. And then of course, bush and pole beans. Peas are typically planted in cooler weather and they're part of this family. You can also replant beans again late in the summer or early fall um, to get them to winter over. And then in the mint family, a lot of things in this family are actually perennial herbs like rosemary and lavender and mint, um, sage, thyme, oregano, marjoram, this huge family of really useful herbs. Uh, basil, though, is an annual, and it is one of those that's probably one of the most sensitive to cool weather and best planted in June, like now. I have had some of mine outside for a while. I have some protected areas. So if you have some good microclimates, you can you can get that in May and, and get them out. So this is what they need. They need warm nights and soil temperatures above 50 degrees, usually around the beginning of June. And as I say, there are shoulders to that. Um, we try to get things out in May as much as we can so we can get longevity in the season. Uh, that gives you a little more variety too of what you can plant that doesn't have just short days. But as I mentioned, in the Northwest, if you were to try to grow some of these hot season crops like tomato and pepper and eggplant from seed, um, you wouldn't be able to do it by waiting until now to put it in the soil when it's warm enough. You need to start them inside February, March, um, get them going. Tomatoes, Mar you can get away with March. The other ones, February is good because they're a little bit slower growing. And then you wait until um, now or you know mid-May to get them out. So here's an example, some different kinds of hot crops, um, had lots of different peppers, tomatoes, and even okra. Okra is difficult here, uh, mostly because it requires consistently hot days and our weather vacillates a lot we you know we've had a lot of 60 something degree days that's not quite as hot as okra likes it but i do know people that grow it and have gotten some crop you know some production out of it um, this is one of those crops that would be fun to experiment with growing under a cloche all summer long you could do it under plastic early when you set them out maybe in may and then um, transition that to some kind of floating row cover that allows a little more air through it, but it still heats up underneath. Um, and I think that would work. The trick with that is you need to make sure you have the ends open so pollinators can get in and um, pollinate those flowers. And here's some others. There's the okra again, cucumber, different kinds of zucchini, um, uh, different kinds of uh, winter squashes, and then the corn. And all of these are um, plants that need that warm temperature in order to, uh, to germinate and, and to grow and just have the roots um, function. If you put things out when it's soil's too cold, they just sort of sit there and it can stump them. So here's a little bit about seed starting. So we use, we've been growing a lot of plants. Um, the Garden Hotline staff also works on a program uh, at TILF that's um, culturally relevant plant starts. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and so we have been, I'm not sure how to get it to go back now. My back button's not working. So we have um, um, a bunch of plants that we've been growing for, uh, since February to give away to people. And, oh, interesting. What's going on here? 
Well, there we go. Giving me my option to go back. I guess it listened to me. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. It's like reloading. Give it a second. There it goes. All right. Get back to the page I really wanted. Um, so we've been growing these plants for a long time to get out into the community and we start, this is how we start them. So we use a soilless seed starting mix that's, you know, basically we call it soilless because it's not really soil. It's a mixture of like coconut core and compost and um, perlite or vermiculite, depending on what we have. And that is a nice loose mixture for plants to get started in. It's not highly nutritious. So once they get a certain size, you need to transplant plant them into some soil to get more um, nutrition going. But basically you need um, a good soil mix, um, some lights, usually it could, because if we're starting in February, even March, uh, daylight can be dim, um, even if you're in a greenhouse. And so using lights can help to uh, enhance the environment for the starts. And then you wanna keep them evenly moist when they're germinating. Um, and once they're sprouted, you can reduce the watering. But remember when you put seeds in the soil, they're just under the surface of the soil and that top part of the soil dries out faster. So you need to make sure that stays evenly moist. And then you can use heat mats in order to keep them, excuse me, um, warm. So this is a wonderful little chart. Um, I think this might've come from Cornell University. I can't remember um, where I found it initially, but. What's really great about this is it tells you the soil temperatures that are optimum for different things to germinate. And the minimum for some of these is pretty low. So what we're looking at here is more of the hot crops. But if you look at the very bottom, you see lettuce is 35 degrees. So it will germinate if soil is that cool, but it really likes 75 degree temperatures. And typically our outdoor soils don't get that hot um, sometimes never that as hot as what you're seeing in this chart, um, but that optimum range we do hit and we hit 60 degrees by usually mid-May, um, but that can go up and down a little bit for a while, depending on the weather. Um, but lettuce, that's why you can get lettuce out so early in the garden in the spring, um, because it can tolerate cool temperatures. Oh my gosh, my thing doesn't know what control to use. There we go. So here's a chart also about when to start things inside. You'll see lettuce really early because you can set it out so easily. Our frost dates in this area are around in April, usually the end of April. Um, and that can vary each year, but you're trying to keep things protected. Lettuce is one of those crops that has a little bit tender leaf. So if you get it out um, and you have a frost that might be affected by it, but you can also protect those with different cloching or putting a row cover over things. Uh, but you'll see a lot of a lot of plants here, like cauliflower, for instance. Those leaves are pretty sturdy, and you can set them out earlier, um, even than what it's suggesting on this chart, because they're they're sturdier leaf and they're not going to be as affected by frost. But this is just a, a way to see the differences between the types of crops. Basil, for instance, um, really they're talking about May. That's the safest time to start setting it out. And I, I got mine out probably around May 8th this year. Um, but uh, some years, June really is the time to get basil out and it, it would be too early otherwise. So these are just good examples. You see okra is later than some of the others and that's the trick, it needs lots of heat but it also needs usually 80 to 100 days to harvest. So we're in this place where, you know, our, you can't get it out until May, but then we need at least 80 to 100 days. And so you're pushing up against fall at that point, um, which is why it's not quite as productive as some other things and why using a cloche could be useful because you could expand the window of time on either side in fall and spring to get it out. Um, so here's a, night, <clears throat> a little graph showing soil temperatures <clears throat> February to March. And you'll see as you get into March, 
you know, it does definitely go up and, and stays sort of consistent for a while. But that's only, you know, just under 50 degrees. So it's still just staying slightly cool. Um, that's Also, our air temperatures are cool. So air temperatures in Seattle, um, you know, top out in um, July and August. And um, in June, sometimes we're looking at temperature. We've been talking about like why you have to start crops at certain times. And you can see that um, these are highs and lows for the Seattle area. Um, you can see that we have our hottest weather in July and August. And things start to warm up, you know, sort of uh, May, June, which is why that's when we're looking at windows for putting up the things for hot weather crops. All right, and then soil temperature changes. Um, so over time in May, we start to see soil temperature um, going up more, but even then you can see some variation in it, which is why we're a little bit careful and why you know, it's it's tricky here. We want to maybe use protection on things that we're trying to get out that need warm temperatures. Um, then I was talking about a seed packet. A seed packet is a wonderful way to learn about um, what you can set out when. Cilantro is one of those herbs that we think of as a hot weather thing because we think of it in use with salsa, but it's not. It's actually something that grows better in cooler weather. And so you want to plant this earlier in the spring, April is fine. And you can do succession sowings because it takes, um, it's really short um, season. It only takes a few days to, or um, about a month maybe to get to harvest. And then um, you can let some of this go to seed. So some of it will bolt and you'll notice it says heat tolerant variety because when it gets too warm, it'll go to seed, but that's not a bad thing. The flowers attract lots of pollinators and beneficial insects. Um, the seeds are coriander, you can harvest them or you can let them self sow and you can keep this going. But basically using a seed packet will tell you usually, and this one actually doesn't tell us how many days to harvest, I don't think, but typically they will have a little box that always says, um, you know, it takes 30 days, it takes 90 days, whatever you're looking at. Um, when your seed's starting, you need good setups with, um, lights and this is a 50 cell tray. Bear in mind, you don't keep things growing in here very long because it's not very deep. They need to be transplanted into real soil and then um, grown. And, you know, these are in a window, but you can have different settings. You could start seeds in little packs like this in a window, as long as you have good light on it. It's gonna stretch a bit if it doesn't have bright light. That's why the light setups are good. Um, this is our soil with seed starting mix that's coconut core, compost, and perlite or vermiculite, it's just one part of each. So whatever proportions you wanna make that, it's fine as long as it's one, they, they equal each other. Um, this is lightweight, it drains well, it holds moisture really well, but it's low in nutrients. So um, it's not something you leave them growing in, it's only to get things started. Um, it's good to use a mister sprinkler head um, type of, um, watering device so that you don't dislodge the seeds once you're trying to get them started. They're just under the soil, but you do need to keep this moist because the seeds can dry out if you don't uh, keep that top layer of the soil wet. Um, you need lights that have full spectrum. Plants uh, receive light in the blue and red range. Um, and the red light <clears throat> is a slow wavelength, blue light is a fast wavelength, and they use both, they don't use green, which is why we see that reflected back to us as a green plant. Um, you keep them on during the day, 12 to 18 hours, and you keep the plants pretty close to the lights so that they don't stretch. And you, as they grow, you just have to have a mechanism to raise your light up and up higher. Transplanting um, the cotyledon, that first set of leaves that comes up is just the seed leaf. This and the radical, which develops into the root system, are already in the seed when you plant it. They are packaged in there. And then once you package, or once you plant it, it, it they emerge, they have the um, food for the plant here, and it allows you um, to get your plant growing because it's feeding the roots, uh, root development. 
once the roots are fully established, um, then you start getting real leaves on it. And we call these true leaves. When you want to transplant, if you're in a 50 cell pack, you might transplant at this stage. You want some true leaves on it. Um, if you're in a bigger pot, you can wait until it has four sets of true leaves. So you get a decent sized plant. But basically just knowing that these are gonna emerge because they're already in the seed, they are feeding the plant, but you're not really there in terms of growth until you get those first true leaves. Um, here's where you can protect from the cold with cloches. Um, you can use a cloche like this I mentioned where you put plastic over it and with the hoops. You can make these bigger. I know people have done this with tomatoes with, you know, you can walk into them, um, high tunnels. And then you can use plastic over this for earlier to get them out earlier and then later transition to this fabric here, this row cover. Uh, Rime is one of the brand names. Basically, it's a polyester fabric that light and air and water goes through. And this is what I mentioned about trying to protect lettuce, which is tender. You can throw um, Rime over it to protect it when you get try to get it out. If you know that the air temperature is going to drop after you put it out in March, just cover it with Rime and that'll help protect it. You can cover the ground after you've seeded something that'll warm it up and get those plants to germinate faster. You can also make little liter bottle cloches for individual plants to protect them as well. Um, you need to harden things off. Uh, I have a nice area on my driveway where I can harden things off because it's protected from the wind and protected from too much sun at that time of year when I'm trying to set things out. Um, they need to be uh, ready for outdoor exposure and um, exposure to sun and temperature and wind. So we usually take about a week to harden off things. You move them outside somewhere where there's filtered sun. They need a little sun, but you don't want direct sun on them. They're going to sunburn because they won't be used to it. So a couple hours the first day, and then you slowly increase that time, one to two hours each day for about a week. And then they're ready to put out. Um, some Sometimes, like my driveway is a good place where I can put them out and I don't need to keep moving them in and out because they are really protected there. And so they actually can acclimate very slowly um, and then I can get them planted where I want them. These are great resources. Um, Elizabeth has the link to the English version of the growing food in the city for you. This is one that we have that's also in language. So it's, uh, it's bilingual Spanish and English. And there's a lot of, I think we have about 17 languages on our website that you can access. So if you know people that speak a different language and um, maybe even want to practice their English, this is a good way to do it because we um, we have these bilingual guides. Um, those are free on the hotline website. And then Maritime Northwest Garden Guide is a book you would purchase. You can get it through nurseries or through the website for Tilt. This is a guide we've been putting out for years. Um, it's been about 10 years since the last update and we're talking right now about updating it again. Um, don't know how soon that's gonna happen, but it's in discussion, but it's a month by month guide. So it can help you understand which things you can put out multiple times during the spring and summer and which things you plant once and leave, um, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. Um, keys to success, location and soil. Um, light, four to six hours ideally. If you have less than that, you're gonna get less production. And I certainly wouldn't put fruiting plants in the, those areas like tomatoes and peppers, um, but you can do things like more greens. Um, some of the herbs like mint and parsley and chives will do okay. You do wanna avoid dark pool areas. Those are places where you really put in, you know, your, your perennial ferns and, you know, beautiful shade garden native plants um, because they don't, uh, most most crops don't do well in that setting. Soil needs to be well drained. If you're planting in a raised bed, you can buy raised bed mixes and you can test and amend your soil as needed. And so it's always good to test your soil periodically. People add compost a lot and don't need it sometimes. Um, it's a good amendment, but only if needed, you can have such a thing as too much organic matter. We also have one of the sheets has a list of where you can get your soil tested that I gave Elizabeth. Um, also, it's really important to find varieties that are going to do well here. So we're always shooting for short season varieties, days to maturity, 80 or less when you look at the seed packet. 
um, that gets you best production. You can push the window on that 90 to 95 um, on something like a tomato, for instance, or a squash, uh, if you can get it out early enough and protect it and also um, have a warm enough spot for it. Um, some of the things though, if you're looking at things like Brussels sprouts, they're gonna be 120 days sometimes, but that's not relative to the hot crops. They're a cool season plant and they can go through the winter and then you harvest them in the spring. Uh, small fruiting varieties are gonna be more productive. For instance, a big green bell pepper isn't, you're not gonna get as many off of that plant as you would the jalapenos off the jalapeno plant. And it seems a little counterintuitive again, because we're talking about hot peppers, you think about hot weather, um, and they do pretty well here actually, and you can get a pretty good um, harvest off of them. Um, choose seed companies that are from Northern states, and that could be all across the United States. We, you know, Johnny's seed is in the East Coast, and I've bought seeds from um, some Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, companies. And, uh, but all of these that you see listed here, Pacific Northwest, either Oregon or Washington, and they have things that are proven to grow well here. Um, so this is a good way to pick those hot crops that are going to be more su successful. You know, Seattle's a big tomato town. We love our tomatoes here. And so we like to grow big beefsteak tomatoes, but we're not Georgia. You know, we're not at Arkansas, which are, I just was in Arkansas not that long ago. And... Um, you know, we don't have that kind of weather to really push out those big beef steaks, but you can do it if you, you know, set yourself up properly. Um, but some of the things to know about um, tomatoes are that there's two kinds. Basically, there are some variations in between here as well, but indeterminate means that it's a vining type. It grows and grows and grows, and it will flower and then set fruit. So you can see the lower down fruit is where the first flowers were. And now those fruits are developing. And then the next shoot has new flowers and then that'll set fruit. And then it'll keep doing that all the way up the plant. You have to provide some sort of support for these. Um, they have often in the um, leaf axles, they have little shoots um, that come up that you need to prune out. You can't let every single one of them grow because if you do, the plant will just be a huge um, huge, huge, you know, um, massive uh, leaders uh, coming out of the ground. Um, however, some people do that on purpose and give them tons of space so that they can do um, very little irrigation because if you have a big plant like that, it shades the ground. And then that's what they call dry farming for tomatoes. Uh, you let them get big. Determinants grow as a bush. They put on all their flower and fruit at the same time. These are great if you wanna can things, for instance, so you can like grow them, get your crop, get them all canned at the same time, and then you're done. Um, the indeterminates are great for continual eating all summer long. Many cherry tomatoes, of course, are indeterminate, but many, many tomatoes actually sit in the indeterminate category. And then there's some variations in between. There's a lot of dwarf varieties now too that will work in little small pots and some from little hanging pots. Um, you know, you don't get a ton of fruit off of them, but they're fun and they, they taste good. And, you know, you could have some interesting decor on your front porch using that. And then heirloom tomatoes are really, um, you know, plentiful. There's tons of them coming from all over the world. In the Northwest, we use a lot of tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes out of like Russia because of the climate um, that they grow where here and then parts of Japan, um, some French hybrids. Um, so, you know, looking, or heirlooms, excuse me, some um, looking at, at heirlooms is fun too because you get stories about how that seed has been saved over time. And then um, hybrids are nothing to worry about. Uh, people worry because, so, you know, it's not, they think it's like a GMO plant. It is not, it's just a cross that's been made to create a stronger plant. In some cases, you know, of course, um, commercially they're looking at longevity and shipping and all that, but some of the hybrids are actually created for disease resistance and for better fruit. Um, so there's lots of reasons why a hybrid plant can be okay. Um, it's particularly true when you're looking at things like cabbages and the cabbage family, broccolis, a lot of those are hybrids and they're healthier and bigger plants. 
Um, so getting them to ripen. So we end up, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, we've we've been sort of used to going into October to get our tomatoes finally picked. Um, but unfortunately, now we have this smoke seasons that happen, and that actually can decrease the sunlight in the air, you know, in the sky. And so your tomatoes slow down in ripening as well. And so um, that we can't do a whole lot about. But in general, um, you want to decrease watering in August um, for indeterminate tomatoes. You don't want to let them continue to grow and grow and grow because you want those bottom tomatoes to, to ripen for you. So you, it's sort of a waiting game to decide when you're gonna cut it off and not let the plant continue to grow. You can top it, you can pick off flowers that haven't produced fruit by September for sure. Um, you can take some of the leaves off, which shade the fruit. You don't wanna totally defoliate it, of course, because this is how the plant is feeding itself, um, but you can remove some of that to get it um, more light. And then you can root prune them, you know, just to, stunt them essentially so that they won't keep growing and that that ripening then will will enhance. Um, you can trellis things like tomatoes, but you can also trellis other things. So on the right, you see a trellis for tomatoes. This is just sort of like a little teepee um, frame with a pole going across the top and strings hanging down. The indeterminate tomatoes, because they grow like a vine, you can actually just take the tops and wrap them around the string. And that is enough to hold them up, which is kind of ingenious. I'm not sure who figured that out, um, but I like that method. It's very simple. Um, you can use tomato cages, but cages are never tall enough for an indeterminate tomato. You usually have to supplement with extra steaks as well. Um, you can also trellis things like cucumbers on these sort of A-frame shaped um, um, <laughs> trellising, you could have one that goes both sides and then you can have a shady area underneath where you could put things like lettuces and spinach and things that don't like the hot sun. Um, and then, you know, really like creatively people um, trellis things like squashes and pumpkins. And you sometimes have to have ways to support the fruit because it's so heavy and it pull the vine down. But this is um, sort of early on before that need is there to see this beautiful display of like hanging um, squash family plants um, that get them up off the ground and get you a lot more room really to grow more, more crops. Um, fertilizing, uh, most of our summer crops are heavy feeders. Um, even, even things like broccoli and cabbages, which are long season, are heavy feeders. You need to make sure they get lots of food, especially nitrogen for them. Um, blooming plants need phosphorus that helps to actually inc increase the number of flowers and fruit that you get. And so you'll see the NPK or the nitrogen phosphorus potassium levels with more potassium for all purpose um, uh, food for vegetables on per, you know, that's purposeful. Um, you'll also see down here this OMRI, you can't quite see the whole thing, but OMRI is the Organic Materials Review Institute. These guys are certifying products as, as um, organic. So it's a certified product to use for farmers. Uh, they have to use things if they are going to uh, label themselves organic, they have to use um, products like this. But there is this uh, nonprofit that certifies products. And so you can find sprays and fertilizers and different elements and um, amendments uh, that have that OMRI listing on them. Um, when you're watering, you want to water regularly and deeply. So don't just do surface watering. That actually is not helpful. You can cause blossom end rot in tomatoes if you don't water deeply enough because it makes it so that the tomato cannot get calcium out of the soil. And that is causes the end of the tomato to start to sort of rot. Um, and it's not a disease, it's just a nutrient deficiency. And it, it isn't gonna help to put more calcium on unless you correct your watering. So the watering really is more important. You wanna make sure the water goes all the way through, down through the root system, and then um, repeat that as needed. Uh, you have to check your soil to see if you need water. Everybody's different, everybody's garden is different. Uh, watering in the morning is ideal because that gives plants time to dry off. 
um, at night when the weather is warm and a humid, and then you have water on the leaves, you can encourage different kinds of diseases. There we go. Okay, so this is one of the, this is a chart from that growing food in the city, which just sort of shows you like succession planting and, you know, things when you can plant again. You'll notice that you can plant peas in March, harvest them in June, July, and then start planting them again late summer um, and harvest again. But you can also plant them, and I've planted them as late as early October and winter them over. Um, and then you get an earlier crop in the spring. So a lot of these things we can play with the windows of, you know, we have a pretty mild climate and we can actually play with that uh, to get things in. But you'll see things like tomatoes, cucumbers, they're pretty much just these heat lovers have this really short sort of window. Um, onions actually are, you know, they are heat lovers, but they're also cool tolerant. So you best get them out in March. It's better for them. They will develop more greens and then develop a better bulb because they're sensitive to day length. Once the days start getting longer, they start developing that bulb. So if you have bigger greens, you're going to get a bigger bulb. Um, but yeah, this is just a great chart to sort of figure out how to put things in the garden, how to share space, how to move things around, how to um, know when you're gonna like harvest something and what else you can put in, uh, even if it's later in the summer. And to know how to choose plants to save for seed, you always wanna pick the biggest and the best. Um, you're gonna sacrifice um, something like a lettuce if you're gonna use it for um, seed um, production, because you're gonna let it bolt and then it's not going to be good to eat um, unless you like really bitter lettuce which is fine some people do you can still eat those leaves but ideally you leave it alone because you want it to have as much energy and resource to be able to um, put into seed production lettuce is one of those that you don't have to isolate quite as much they're self self pollinating and so often you can have different kinds of lettuce in the garden and they won't cross pollinate but even if they do you're still going to get a decent lettuce out of it. So it's sort of fun sometimes because you'll get new varieties of lettuce. Um, but you're going to use open pollinated plants um, because they need to be plants that will come true in their generation. If you have a hybrid, it means you have two parents and you will get one of those parents in the seed that's developed, not both, not both, or not the plant that you were growing. Um, you do want to choose things that performed well in your microclimate. So what did well in your yard? What did you really like? Um, you know, you can, you can save seeds from many things um, as long as they are open pollinated crops. Um, a lot of people save tomato seeds over the years. It's how we get these heirloom crops, um, but you can do that yourself as well. Um, these are some of the insects and diseases to watch for. We're not going to go into great detail here, but you can always call us at the hotline if you have more questions about this. Um, I just listed the ones that are most obvious. Uh, there's lots of other things that can happen, but the things we hear about the most, especially, are powdery mildew, late blight, and rust for diseases. And then for insects, aphids, the imported cabbage worm, the leaf miner, stink bugs, and spit bugs. And we're going to take a look at those. So for diseases on the left, you're going to see, see beans with rust on it. Onions can get rust as well. Garlic is really notorious for that. There's not a lot you can do about it. Um, once it's there, it's there. Sometimes it affects the crop so much that you get have failure with the crop. Um, but there's no real big prevention for it. It's in the area. Um, if I had rust on beans in a bed and it was a raised bed, I wouldn't plant beans in that again for a while, maybe a year or two. Um, and I'd try something else that may be uh, in that area. And rust, like powdery mildew, is one of those things that isn't necessarily the same on every plant. So powdery mildew, for instance, what gets on squash is not going to get on your tomato, for instance. They're different species of disease organisms, and we call them all powdery mildew because they look like this powdery white substance. Squash are notorious for this, usually happens later in the summer. This is an anomaly in the disease world because typically we say don't wet the leaves, but actually water on the surface of leaves for powdery mildew can inhibit it because it keeps the spores from flying. You just don't want to do that late in the evening because humidity at night in warm temperatures will increase the disease. 
So early in the day, a little watering down when the leaves can dry off is a good thing. It can, it can um, change it. Sometimes people use um, baking soda sprays on these guys to, um, it changes the pH on the surface of the leaf so that the disease doesn't grow as well. Uh, if you don't have a lot, if you just a leaf here and there, pick those leaves out. Um, it's in the area, it's just around, it's hard to prevent. Um, humid, like I said, humidity will, will increase it. If you put a pipe in when you plant squash, um, like a perforated pipe or even just a long PVC pipe on a couple spots and water directly into those, that helps to keep the soil from getting wet and that decreases humidity so that you don't have to worry about it quite as much. And then the worst thing of all, of course, is late blight on tomatoes, which we're seeing the damage on the fruit and what the leaves look like. You'll get sunken lesions in the stem that kind of enters from splashing soil that gets up onto the plant. Keeping these open air circulation, keeping them pruned well will help because the leaves aren't touching each other and the um, spores um, aren't moving quite as quickly through the plant, but late blight spores can fly for quite a while, quite a ways. And so they can infect, you know, big pea patch garden can get infected by one person's plant, um, which is really sad. I've had this happen where I had a whole crop of tomatoes overnight we had about eight different varieties of tomatoes uh, living with a friend in Snohomish and she lived on this little boggy lake which is really cool and we had these beautiful tomato plants but then late blight hit and within like a night we started to see it just run through the plants and we lost, we lost all the tomatoes very sad um, so prevention for this is you can put um, like plastic mulches down that will keep soil from splashing up you can grow them under cover where you can control the water you can do drip irrigation only, keep them open, keep them pruned, and don't plant back in the same area where you've had tomatoes too many times because if there's any disease in the soil, it will build up. Remember that these are, you know, these are organisms that need a habitat. So these are their habitats and you're trying to prevent um, giving them a home. So you don't wanna like give them their best uh, situation. And then the insects that we see a lot, uh, I'm gonna start with aphids in the bottom left corner. These are cabbage aphids. You'll see among broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts. They start really early in the season. There's a little parasitoid wasp that loves to put eggs into each of these and it kills them. Uh, the eggs develop and kill the aphid. And um, I see them hunting in kale, um, even down in the stem junctions in April. So they're out pretty early looking for aphids, but with any predator prey population, there's more prey than there is predator. So sometimes you'll get a buildup before they start doing their job, um, but you wanna be looking for little dried out husks of aphids and then you'll know they're busy. And that means you don't wanna spray anything because you want them to do their job and let, let that happen on its own. Um, you can hand wash these off if it's too bad and you don't see wasp activity. Um, the lady beetles will help take care of these, lacewing, um, hoverfly larva, all kinds of things, love to eat aphids. There's black aphid on things like nasturtium and beans, and there's green aphids on other things and like roses. Um, I am seeing a fair amount of aphid damage on some shrubs in our garden at the children's garden at Tilth right now on the tip growth. They love the new growth because that's where all the sugars are. And if you feed them too much, if you also, if you're giving a lot of fertilizer to plants, not vegetables, which need it, but your shrub, trees and shrubs, um, you can encourage aphids by doing too much fertilizing. Um, the imported cabbage worm is this next one top right. That's that little um, green worm caterpillar. This is a, a sort of little white butterfly that's probably flying around my yard right now. Um, they come out in April, they have several generations a year. They are a butterfly, they do pollinate, so they have some good features, but they love to lay their eggs on your uh, collards and broccoli and cabbage. And because especially, you know, cabbage and your collards, you're trying to eat the leaf of it. This is creating a lot of damage and they're messing up your, your crop. Um, you wanna look for eggs and pull them off. They're little barrel shaped kind of uh, yellowish eggs on the back of the leaf and you wanna pull those off of there. Um, and then the best thing to do is to prevent it. So you would put 
floating row cover over these as soon as you planted them after you inspected them to make sure there was nothing on them. And then um, you can keep the flying insect, the butterfly away from laying her eggs. Uh, leaf miner is a fly and it's the same thing. You would use a floating row cover and this is what we see on this charred leaf. Beets, charred spinach are affected. Um, they tunnel between the two layers of the leaf and kind of chew their way through it and make all these dead, you know, tunnels and trails. And again, these are leaf props, even with beets, I like to eat the beet greens. So if you um, have them in your beets and, and your chard and your spinach, you're not gonna get much production. So again, use that floating row cover, look for the eggs, which are actual little tiny white um, uh, eggs that look like little tiny specks of rice on the back of the leaf. They're on the bottom of the leaf. This is a spittle bug that's on lavender right now. They're all over the place. There's a little green bug down in there that's um, sucking the juices out of the plant. They don't do a tremendous amount of damage, but they can, you know, they don't look great, but they can also um, transmit viruses sometimes to different plants. And that's about the worst they do. You can spray these off. They had, the spittle was there to protect them from birds, which would eat them if they saw them because they're pretty stationary and soft. Um, body, so they're easy to get rid of. Um, and then the last one is a uh, stink bug, and this particular one is a southern green stink bug, which arrived in the northwest about maybe eight years ago now. Um, wasn't here before, it was in California, and it was mostly in the east coast in Florida, especially. And these guys are you know, generalists, they like to eat everything. They are a true bug, so they don't go through like a, a stage like the imported cabbage worm with a caterpillar. They just have eggs that hatch, and then they have little little uh, bugs and bigger bugs, and they go through instars. And they look different, but this is very diagnostic. They're spotted these guys, and when they get to be an adult, they're green, and they don't. They look just like our native green stink bug, which can cause damage, but isn't as problematic. Um, these guys seem to move around a bit though. They don't seem to linger anywhere for very long. So what we've seen is you'll see like big explosions of them in a garden and then the next year you don't have very many and somebody else has them somewhere else. Um, they have seen some of our native predators that take care of our native stink bugs affecting them. Um, so that's good news. Uh, I've seen them caught in spider webs um, quite frequently actually. And they're actually kind of pretty when you first notice them, they're unmistakable. They go through a bunch of different color changes and be, get some reds in them and then some pink and green, and then they become solid green. Uh, in the fall, you might find them in sunflower or calendula. They like to be where they eat the seeds. So they're kind of nestled into the flowers. Um, and you can get rid of them there. And you'll find them in all different stages all, all through the summer. They, they should be appearing now pretty frequently. All right, so overall managing pests, you should always choose preventative measures first, like putting the floating row cover over or having lots of flowers in the garden that will attract predators like lady beetles or um, parasitoid wasps. Parasitoid wasps really like those carrot family plants with the, with the umbrella shaped flowers. So things like cilantro, yeah, that's why that's good to grow. Um, then use hand control methods like spraying them off with water or picking them off, removing leaves that have a lot of damage and, and larva or eggs on them. Um, and use sprays as a last resort. Even the certified organic products can cause harm to beneficial insects. They're oil and soap based, they're not selective. And so if you have things like lady beetle eggs on a leaf, you're gonna kill them as well. So just be aware, get to know what they look like um, because you wanna know the difference between a good bug and a bad bug. and um, there are lots of different resources out there for that. You can call us on the hotline, but also there's some great books and there's some um, a website called Grow Smart, Grow Safe that has lots of alternative things. And there's, I think there's a guide through King County on their King County natural resource site that they used to publish like a, a really great little good bug um, guide, but they don't anymore. Um, but you can still find that information. And that's what I have for you today. We are a program that's managed by Tilt Alliance. So we work at Tilt, but we're sponsored by um, Seattle Public Utilities and the Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County. And then also our RainWise um, 
program that's city Seattle based, but it's King County and um, SPU both and Cascade Water Alliance. So we're out around the county talking to people all the time about how to grow things and how to use natural methods to manage um, pests and to use natural fertilizers and all that so we don't pollute our waterways. Thank you so much, Laura. Fabulous presentation as always. I'm so sorry we got cut off there for a minute. We lost a couple of people. Oh, it's it's all good. To, um, uh, some of them said that they were going to watch the replay and uh, reach out if they had any any questions. So great, sounds good. Yeah. Well, thank you everyone who tuned in live with us today. We surely appreciate you, and I hope you have a wonderful beautiful weekend what a lovely weekend to get in the garden so i know i'm inspired now right <laughs> i can i can dig it <laughs> yay yay And we're back. Yay. So sorry, everybody. I don't know.